It's good to be here tonight. Uh, I would have been here anyway to hear Elder Staten, but he's not here, and, and I'm right here. <laughs> and I, so normally I sit back there. And I understand Brother Shannon's reasoning on why he hadn't invited local uh, preachers, and I, I perfectly understand that. Um, Brother Don Douglas is probably second only to my wife to hear the same messages more than once. Uh, my wife never really complained. I asked her about that one time. She said, no, I don't really mind because, you know, she always picks up something in the second go around that she didn't quite get the first time. Uh, but the wives hear a lot of the same sermons. Um, but it is good to be here tonight. And I hope that you will continue to be in prayer for me while I stand before you. Enjoyed the good song service. Thankful for the prayer. And appreciate all of you that have come out tonight on a Friday night. The Apostle John had a lot of interesting stories to tell. But he wasn't telling these stories just for amusement or just human interest stories. <clears throat> he had a reason behind all the stories that he told. And John tells of a number of miracles that Jesus performed when he was here on earth. And John knew that there was a reason behind those miracles. And he doesn't leave us in the dark concerning the reason behind those miracles because he comes right out and tells us. Just right after he had completed telling a lot of these miracles that Jesus had performed, he said in, in John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. So he tells us that these miracles are recorded so that we might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. So whenever we go back and look at all of these miracles, and I preached on, I suppose, just about every one of them, and you keep that in mind, why these miracles were written. The first miracle that Jesus performed was interesting, and some, in some ways it leaves us scratching our heads. Jesus came into the world because of it being broken and in such a dark condition. And it's still broken. And it still is in a dark condition. I'm thankful that we have little points of light scattered around. But he came to show how things can be set right. Although we're born into a world of sin, a world that filled with corruption, Jesus will bring the history of man, despite all of that, to a very glorious conclusion. And I'm looking forward to that conclusion. I have said, and I still feel, that if someone... <clears throat> hope the Lord doesn't come back till they finish college or hope the Lord doesn't come back till I get married or the Lord doesn't come back until I get my promotion. They just don't really understand the significance and the glory of the Lord's coming back. Amen. Because all of that won't matter. Right. I, I assure you of that. That's right. Just ask the people that have already died and gone on, 
if they missed this world. <laughs> if they would come back, if they could. I don't think so. That was a miracle, another one of the miracles that Jesus uh, performed was raising Lazarus. And you know, I don't think Lazarus really wanted to come back. <laughs> but he had to come back because he heard his name called. The second chapter of John begins with a marriage feast. Jesus' mother was there. Jesus and his disciples, they were also invited to come. Weddings and wedding feasts, back then, in those days, was a whole lot bigger deal than what they are now. And I know some parents say, I don't see how, but uh, believe me, they were a bigger deal and they lasted a lot longer mm -hmm. in the days of Christ. Each wedding was a public event for the entire community or the town. It was especially special for the bride and for the groom. The feast oftentimes would last for a week. Now, can you imagine uh, hosting a wedding feast, reception, that lasted a week? It's hard enough just for one that lasts a couple of hours. <laughs> <coughs> the chapter opened with what would seem like a disaster to the bride and the groom. They ran out of wine. One of the most important elements in the ancient feast was the wine. The wine was very important. And when they run out of wine, essentially, you could, I guess, say the party's over. <laughs> Everybody might as well go home. Let's read the account of this so it'll all be familiar in your mind once again. Let's go to chap uh, John chapter 2 verses 1 through 11. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine the mother of Jesus said unto him they have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. I want you to, as we go through it, keep that phrase in the back of your mind. Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servant, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone, after the manner of the purifying of the Jews containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water, and they fill them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast Call the bridegroom, and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. So this was the beginning miracle. This is how he started out with his miracle. I have preached this as something as simple as because his mother Mary was concerned for the wedding couple. It was their feast. She was concerned so she asked Jesus to do something about it. Simple request 
And I've preached that sometimes the Lord is involved in our everyday life. More than what we might realize. Sometimes we pray for it not to rain. And guess what? It doesn't rain. Or sometimes we pray that we don't run out of gas before we can get to a gas station. And we don't run out of gas. Could be something as simple as that. And I preached an entire sermon on that. That the Lord wants us to know that He with us and that He cares about what we care about. And that's important for us to understand. Amen. Now Jesus didn't have to exercise his power in this situation. But he did. When he chose to do so, it was the beginning of miracles. It manifested his glory. He began to reveal his true identity to others and Miracles, remember, are for a sign. Yeah. There's a reason why we have those miracles. Consider, this is the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. Imagine you're an inventor and you're about to launch a new product. A new product that you have just invented. You put lots of time and effort into it. Or maybe you're a political candidate uh, and you're running for public office. In either case, you choose your first public presentation with care. You put a lot of thought into it. You want to get the most bang for your buck. Each detail is carefully controlled. You want people to see the need and the importance of what it is that you have to offer. So a lot of thought and effort goes into <clears throat> whenever you're about to launch something for the first time. But now let's look at the circumstances with Jesus, his first miracle. Nobody there was possessed with demons. Nobody was dying. Nobody was starving. So why would Jesus, Jesus' first sign of what it was all about be to keep the party going. Why would he use supernatural power to produce wine at a feast? Why, why would he? Why would he use supernatural power to produce wine at a feast? Sure, it was a social embarrassment for the wedding couple but it certainly wasn't a life or death situation, was it? What did this act signify about why Jesus came into the world? Well, we know that Jesus came into the world to humble himself, to lay aside his glory, to only then be rejected, and to ultimately... Go to the cross. But all of that is a means to an end. The end is to bring a great festival of joy. Psalms 34, 8. Taste and see that the Lord is good. I've preached a number of sermons on the Lord is good. But don't we already know the Lord is good? The fact the Bible tells us how good he is. Well, of course, you know the Lord is good. But David wants you to taste it, to experience it. It's one thing to hear it, to read it, but it's an altogether different thing when you can actually taste it. Amen. Mary, my wife, was a good cook. And boy, I miss her cooking. And she was real well known for her fried pie. Uh -huh. Amen. <laughs> Apricot and apples. Yes. 
She used to just make apricot, and I said, why don't you make some apple pies too? So she did. But boy, she, she got it just right. I could tell you how good they were, but to really know for sure how good they actually were, you'd have to taste them. And that's what David wanted us to do, to taste and see how good the Lord is. Amen. Isaiah 25, 6, And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wines on the lead. Yes. This is described in the coming of the gospel day. But then it is it's carried on out to the very end of time. Verse 8, he will swallow up death in victory and the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces. Jesus makes a statement at the marriage feast that seems unusual. Verse 3 and 4, and when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, they have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. We know from the gospel account that Jesus is not easily irritated. Jesus doesn't say things that he regrets. I do. I say things that I regret sometimes. I do things that I regret sometimes. There's some regret that I have that I will carry to my grave. Regrets that will go with me the rest of my life. But I've told people, you and you probably have regrets too. I see your head shaking. We all have some regret, don't we? But you'll never regret saying a kind word to somebody. That's right. That's right. You'll never regret doing a kind deed for somebody. Amen. You'll never regret picking up the phone and asking somebody, how are they doing? Right. Just wanted to talk to you. Do you need anything? You'll never regret things like that. So Jesus doesn't say things that he regrets. Even when he was being tortured, he never speaks an angry word. Like a sheep before sheared dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Being tortured and beaten and spit upon, he never said a word. So his comments to his mother is not just a bad mood. There's something that's weighing very heavily on him. And he lets us know what it is. He says, my hour is not yet come. If you read the book of John, you'll find that he refers to his hour on other occasions. Each time he's speaking of his death on the cross. <clears throat> when he answers his mother, what was he thinking? You ever wondered that? What was he thinking whenever he, whenever his mother asked him, why does he connect a simple request for wine with his death? Now, think of the symbolism that we have. The miracle will be a sign of what he's come to do. In the Old Testament, the Jews had a number of cleansing and purification rites that they would go through. They pointed to our spiritual need. They vividly got across the idea that God is holy and God is perfect. And it conveyed the idea that we're not holy and we're not perfect. We're all flawed. In order to connect with God, there has to be an atoning cleansing. We can't just walk into God's presence. So the Jews had many purification rites leading up to the blood sacrifice. 
And the, at the marriage feast, the water pots were filled with water and turned to wine. They're described in verse 6. And there was set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews containing two or three firkins apiece. Water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews. What does the wine represent in Christ's mind? Well, you know the answer to that, his blood. When Jesus makes that odd statement to his mother, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. It was as if he was looking far away, past his mother, and past the bride and groom, and past the whole wedding scene. Jesus is seeing something else. He's thinking, possibly. Yes, I can bring joy to the festival. I can renew their supply of wine. I can cleanse man from his guilt and shame. I've come into the world to bring joy. But he might be thinking, but oh mother, I'm going to have to die to do this. There may be more going on in his mind. God shows us in the Old Testament that he doesn't want to relate to us only as a king over his subjects. But he also wants to relate to us as a groom relates to his bride. Isaiah 62, 5, as the bridegroom rejoiceth over the bride. So shall thy God rejoice over thee. In the New Testament, Christ's disciples are criticized for not fasting. Jesus replies in Mark 2, 19, Can the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? Did you hear that? Jesus calls himself the bridegroom. John continues the theme in Revelation 21 2. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Revelation 19 and 9. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the, unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. One day there is truly going to be a feast Amen. of all feasts. Right. And this is going to be how history ends. Right. This is what Jesus came ultimately to accomplish. So now Jesus finds himself at a wedding. All his work is still ahead of him. Because this was the beginning of his ministry. The beginning of miracles. So he now he has all of his work ahead of him. Let me ask you, what do single people think at weddings? Those that aren't married yet. Why do they seem to have a far away look in their eyes? Because they're looking beyond the current bride and groom. They're looking and thinking of what their own wedding will be like. And perhaps this is what Jesus is thinking about. Maybe he's thinking of his own wedding with his church. Thinking of the joy that that day will bring. But also the horror that he'll have to go through in order to bring that about. How many grooms, how many grooms have been beaten in order to have the wedding? How many have been spit upon, ridiculed, and mocked in order to have the wedding? No, everybody usually, congratulations. You're a lucky man. So when the mother of Jesus tells him they have no wine, he answers, woman, what have I to do with thee? 
My hour is not yet come. To paraphrase, he could be saying, Mother, for my people to be married to me, I'm going to have to die. For my people to drink the cup of joy at the marriage feast, I'm going to have to drink the cup of punishment and death. In theory, Jesus could have begun his public ministry in a number of ways. If he wanted to establish his credentials as a teacher, the first thing that he could have done would, would have been to preach the Sermon on the Mount. If he wanted to show his power over demons, he could have cast out the legion of devils in the gathering. If he wanted to reveal his power over death, Jesus could have easily brought back someone from the dead, like raising Lazarus from the dead. There were a number of ways that Jesus could have demonstrated his power. But he didn't do any of those. The first public ministry, the first public miracle or sign that Jesus performed was to turn water into wine at a Jewish wedding. Seemed like he could have done something more momentous. Before Jesus displayed his wisdom as a teacher, before he exercised his authority to cast out demons, and before he manifested his power over death, the very first thing he did to set the stage for the rest of his ministry was to perform a miracle. Although he was unmarried, he deliberately acted like a bridegroom providing wine for a wedding. But he wasn't married. But he was acting like the bridegroom. Why was that? We need to take a close look at what was said and what was done at this wedding. This story that I've read to you, it raises a number of questions, doesn't it? Why does Mary bring the lack of wine to Jesus' attention? He's the only guest at the wedding. He's only a guest at the wedding. Why didn't she inform the host of the wedding? Jesus was just a guest. Why wouldn't she go to the host of the wedding? Why did Jesus respond to his mother the way that he does? Jesus addressing Mary as woman seems to, in our mind, come across as disrespectful. Also, a declaration that his hour has not yet come. What a strange way to react to Mary's observation that the wine is run out. Kind of an odd reaction, isn't it? I mean, when you read that, it kind of sets you back. She just tells me, you know, they've run out of wine. Woman, what have I to do with thee? All she says, again, is, they don't have wine. What has that got to do anyway with Jesus' hour? The fact that they don't have wine. There's something else that's puzzling. After what seems to be his resistance, what seems to be his resistance to Mary's words, why does Jesus then turn around and solve the problem of no wine by performing a miracle? Why does it seem like he's not interested and that, you know, you shouldn't even be asking me this, but then why did he turn right around and do it? Well, the sign must have had some meaning to his Jewish disciples. So what was it? What was this sign? What was this meaning? that might have been picked up by his Jewish disciples. When we look at these questions in light of the old Jewish scripture, 
we have several key points that begin to emerge. It suggests that there is more going on than what first meets the eye. Have you ever wondered that? Or have you ever just thought, well, that was just a good, nice deed? Or was there, was there something else going on here? First of all, Jesus wasn't being disrespectful to Mary when he said, woman, what have I to do with thee? Again, that may sound disrespectful in our ears, in our day and time. But in the, but in the language and context of the time, it wasn't. Jesus uses woman on other occasions to address other women. The Samaritan woman at Jacob's well, John 4, 21, says, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Then we have Mary Magdalene at the empty tomb of Jesus. While she stood without weeping and saw the two angels, John 20, 13 says, And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? And then she sees Jesus. Verse 15. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? Then you have the Canaanite woman, whose daughter was grievously vexed with the devil. And she was asking Jesus for help. In Matthew 15, 28, Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Then you have the woman who had been over for 18 years. In Luke 13, 12, And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. In all of these occasions, there isn't a hint of rebuke or disrespect That's right. in that. Remember, Jesus never says anything that he regrets. Jesus even uses the same expression while he was hanging on the cross. John 19, 26, when he said, When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Now we know it would have been absurd to think Jesus would be disrespectful to Mary just moments before he died. That would be absurd. Amen. For him to, in fact, for him to dishonor his mother, even at the wedding, especially to dishonor his mother in public, would be breaking one of the Ten Commandments. Right. Exodus 20, 10, honor thy father and thy mother. And that means just what it says. Amen. Honor your father and your mother. Now, you might not like everything they do, but you have to honor That's your right. father and your mother. That's right. What about Jesus' word? What have I to do with thee? That same expression is used at times in both the Old Testament and it's also used in the New Testament. Although it's not necessarily a respectful, a disrespectful phrase, it does indicate some kind of refusal or some type of resistance. Since these are the words of Jesus to his mother, it seems that the best interpretation is that Jesus is respectfully declining some aspects of Mary's words, what it seems like. Well, what does it seem like he's refusing? And why is he refusing? At first, it might seem to be unwilling to solve the, at first he might seem to be unwilling to solve the problem of no wine. Well, at first sound, I mean, that's what, that's what, if he answered me that way, if I told him, you know, they'd run out of wine, what have I got to do with it? My hour's not come. 
At first, it might seem that he was unwilling to solve the problem of wine. But we know that can't really be the answer. Because he goes on and changes the water to wine. Also, if he was refusing to do, if what, if all he was refusing to do was just to perform a miracle, then we would still be left scratching our heads about the reason he gives. You know, one thing he's just refusing to do a miracle. But then we wonder about the reason, the, what, what is the reason, what does that have to do with it? He said, my hour is not yet come. That would leave us scratching our heads. So what exactly is he refusing? To answer this question, we have to put Mary's words, they have no wine, in their original Jewish context. Now follow me here. On one hand, Mary seems to be making a simple request for Jesus to solve the problem of no wine. Back then, it was customary for a Jewish wedding to raise a week. And wine, again, was the choice drink. In our day, any bride or mother of the bride knows the kind of planning involved in a wedding reception. The husbands even eventually realize it and realize how much it costs. Just to have enough food and drink to satisfy the people for just a few hours is a major task. Just try to imagine hosting a celebration that lasted for a whole week. So Mary brings the situation to Jesus' attention. Again, if this is all that Mary is asking for, Jesus' response doesn't make sense because he goes on and does what she asks. He fixes the wine problem. Well, my next question is why? Why did he fix that wine problem? The answer may just lie in the Old Testament. From an ancient Jewish perspective, Mary's words aren't just about this particular wedding. They also appear to be an allusion to Jewish scripture. They have no wine. The statement Mary made is very similar to a prophecy of Isaiah. He describes the people of Israel's, he describes the people of Israel's desire for the wine of salvation. Isaiah 24 verses 7, 9, and 11. The new wine mourneth. The vine languisheth. All the merry. All the merry hearted do sigh. They shall not drink wine with song. There is a crying for wine in the streets. All joy is darkened. The mirth of the land is gone. Now, if Mary, if, and I, and I underline that word, if, if Mary is alluding to the book of Isaiah, the implications of this are huge because the prophecy doesn't end with Israel running out of wine. That's not the way it ends. In response to the people's lack of wine, Isaiah prophesied, that the Lord himself will respond by giving them at some time in the future a very special feast of wine. Where is that? Isaiah 25 verses 6 through 8. And in, and in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all the people a feast of fat things, a feast of wines on the leaves, a fat thing full of marrow of wines on the leaves well refined. And he will destroy this mountain 
And it was, and, and he will destroy in this mount the face of the covering cast over the people and the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death in victory and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces and the rebuke of the people shall he take away from all the earth for the Lord has spoken it. I want you to notice in the book of Isaiah the Messiah is not actually mentioned. It is the Lord who gives the wine of the banquet. And that's important to note. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you why in a minute. Notice three features of this particular feast. First, it will be a sacrificial feast of wine. That's what Isaiah means when he talks about fat things and well-refined wine. In the Jewish temple, both the fat of the sacrifice and the fine wine were offered to God. Second, it will be a feast for both Israel and the Gentiles. That's what Isaiah means when he says it will be unto all people, both Jew and Gentile. This, this thing's getting deep, isn't it? And it's really spreading out, isn't it? Third and finally, it will be a feast that will undo the effects of the fall of Adam and Eve. Big deal, isn't it? Amen. By means of God's feet, he will swallow up death in victory and sins of all the redeemed will be taken away. If this interpretation of Mary's words is correct, and again, well, let me say this. Preaching is kind of like a coloring book. The preachers have liberty to use a lot of different colors, just as long as they stay in between the lines. <laughs> I trust I'm staying in between the lines here. If I didn't think I was staying in between the lines, I wouldn't be up here preaching it. So if this interpretation of Mary's words is correct, then Jesus' unusual response my hour is not yet come. Suddenly, it begins to make sense, doesn't it? By performing the miracle of wine, Jesus is beginning to reveal his identity as the long-awaited Jewish Messiah. Amen. To see this clearly, notice the quality and the amount of wine. Six stone water pots used for the Jewish rites of purification. Somewhere between 120 and 180 gallons. That's a lot of wine. Yes. <clears throat> From an ancient Jewish perspective, the amount would call to mind the scripture. The future of salvation would be characterized by super abundant wine. Amos 9, 11, and 13. In that day, I will raise up the tabernacle of David that is fallen. The mountain shall drop sweet wine, and all the hills shall melt. Joel 3, 18. And it shall come to pass in that day that the mountain shall drop down new wine, and all the rivers of Judah shall flow with waters and a fountain shall come forth of the house of the Lord. For those who have the eyes to see it, Jesus is signaling that this scripture is being fulfilled in himself. Amen. For those that are able to see it, he's given a sign, he's given a signal that this is about me. 
by agreeing to provide wine for the wedding, Jesus began to reveal that he is not just the Messiah, that he is also the bridegroom. As a guest, Jesus wasn't responsible for providing food or drink. He was just a guest. That wasn't his responsibility. This would have been the responsibility of the bridegroom and his family. This is another reason why Mary's request seems a little odd. The logical person to bring the problem to would be the host, the bridegroom himself. But she goes to Jesus, and he solves it. She isn't just asking him to solve an embarrassing family problem. Again, in a Jewish context, She's also asking him to assume the role of the bridegroom. You see that? If Mary's request isn't just about the wine at Cana, but also about the wine of Jesus' prophecy, the implication of Jesus' actions run even deeper. In the Old Testament, God is referred to as the bridegroom. Isaiah 62, verses 4 and 5. Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, neither shall thy land any more be termed desolate. For the Lord delighteth in thee, and thy land shall be married. For as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. And as the bridegroom rejoiceth over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. Amen. When we combine the prophecies of the wine of the Lord God with the prophecies of the bridegroom, Jesus' actions in Canaan lead us to conclude this, that by transforming the water into wine and assuming the role of the Jewish bridegroom. Jesus is also beginning to reveal the prophecy of the divine that of the divine bridegroom that are being fulfilled in him. By means of the miracle at Canaan, Jesus is beginning to reveal the mystery of his divine identity. That's why he started with changing water to wine. That was the beginning of him revealing who he was. Now what did we start out with tonight? John tells us a lot of miracles, doesn't he? Now, when you, well, after what we've just discussed, see how much sense this makes to you in John, back in John chapter 20 again, <clears throat> verse 30 and 31, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. Here's what I want you, or what I want to leave with you. But these are written, that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. So how about that? Jesus wasn't just uh, keeping the party going. There was something much deeper going on, something much deeper being revealed. That's how he started out. And once we kind of can grasp that, I'll say amen to that. Jesus, you did good. That was a good way to start. May the Lord add his blessing. Amen.